Welcome to Daybreak Australia. I'm Heidi Stroud-Watts in Sydney, where markets have just come online. I'm Annabelle Drullers in Hong Kong. We're counting down to Asia's major trading opens. The top stories this hour. Asian stocks are set for a mixed open as traders brace for a barrage of economic data this week. The Fed's favoured inflation gauge expected to rise the most in a year. Berkshire's cash pile scales a new record as the conglomerate struggles to find meaningful deals. Plus, Australia and the UAE expect to conclude their free trade agreements by this year, while talks with the EU and India remain on hold for now. Well, this is a picture as we open trading for the week across the Asian markets. And, of course, what a week last week was. And uh, one of the highlights today will be Japan coming back online after reaching that December 1989 uh, record. But, of course, we did have the long weekend with the Emperor's birthday holiday. So perhaps a little bit of catch up uh, or cash catch down. Uh, this is a picture when it comes to the trickling start to uh, trading here in Sydney. We're seeing a pretty, start, uh, a pr pretty flat start at the moment. We're also watching the Aussie dollar. It's about 65, 63 at the moment. Broadly, Asian stocks uh, set for a mixed open. Traders bracing for what is expected to be a flood of economic data and reports this week. They include Chinese activity gauges that could kind of point the next direction when it comes to where Chinese equities go from here, despite what we have seen as a flurry of more regulatory measures and policymakers trying to stem uh, the, the, the flow of negative sentiment for Chinese stocks. We're also getting the Fed's preferred measure of inflation, which is particularly key given uh, the tone of caution that we've had from Fed speakers over the past few days and the fact that, of course, we have seen both producer prices and consumer prices coming in hotter than expected and that repricing taking place when it comes to Fed uh, cut expectations. Kiwi stocks are on the back foot already about three-tenths of 1% lower. We are seeing a pretty muted picture for Chicago Nikkei futures as they come back into the trading fray. Dollar yen now above that 150 level again, so perhaps we'll see some uh, verbal intervention, some some commentary from uh, the FX regulators in Tokyo today as well. Uh, taking a, a look at A50 China futures and we're looking sort of modestly to the upside there. Let's get some views from our next guest who favours US large cap and Japan for investing. Kerry Craig is a global market strategist at JP Morgan Asset Management. He joins us now from our Melbourne studio. So, uh, Kerry, always great to have you with us. And, and, and I suppose, you know, when it comes to broader markets, the narrative has been split between watching the Fed in terms of the repricing that we see for easy expectations and also wondering on the back of NVIDIA how much further this AI-related tech rally can go. Where are you seeing the opportunities for right now? Uh, good morning, Heidi. And that's uh, you know a very good summary of where we are right now, where the market has largely sort of discounted the outlook for interest rates to come down over the course of this year, moving back into line with uh, what central banks have largely been telling us. And then at the same time, we've seen bond yields move up 45 basis points the last week. But yet, equity markets have continued to move higher on the outlook for for greater earnings coming through, and that soft landing narrative really becoming embedded. So we very much do have that base case of thinking about an economy that is slowing around the world that you are seeing inflation, which is um, flattening out a little bit, but still heading down. It's falling like a feather rather than a stone. Uh, and that should actually be quite positive for the equities outlook. So we were still thinking about the quality bias that comes with US large cap. We are looking at the structural changes in the Japanese market to say there's still room for equities to perform in this environment. But again, it's about broadening out that exposure within those indices and perhaps thinking about uh, a little bit more growth coming through in other parts of the world, which may op offer opportunities if we start to look towards Europe. We see growth come back there and also those relative valuation arguments but for now it is a case of still thinking about the quality bias with US large cap being slightly more defensive in the positioning in there but also thinking about those relative value opportunities that may present themselves as we get a clearer picture on growth and inflation. Kerry, how are you feeling about some of the, obviously Japan is still a very popular play uh, going into this new year, but we're also seeing a resurgence, you know, quite a turnaround for Korean stocks as well. And a lot of the same factors in the narrative for Korea, or for Japan, I should say, seem to also apply for Korea. Do you see better opportunities in East Asia right now? 
We are looking uh, around the rest of the region for, say, you know, Korea, Taiwan, India to a certain extent as well in terms of uh, markets that are, are going to do well if we do have um, a little bit more growth in the global economy. I mean, the PMI numbers that have been coming out for developed markets have been improving, particularly on the manufacturing side, which sort of leans into the idea that we're going to get a bit of an inventory cycle uh, rebound coming through after a lot of inventory has got drawn down. You can look at the new orders to inventory ratio to, to sort of justify that move. And also a bit of a cycle when it comes through to handsets and that um, feeding into a better outlook for these uh, input producers to those goods. So we are definitely looking at the sort of rest of Asia while there are some concerns around China in terms of how to position for that um, better growth outlook and definitely that move away from recession in the US. Being cautious on China, what do you make of the recent rally though? Would you consider buying back in at these sort of levels? I mean, the valuation argument is very compelling when you look at the Chinese market, and I think there is definitely opportunities that are going to present themselves. For now, the market is taking a, a bit of a view around, I guess, stabilisation in the outlook rather than a reacceleration of the economy is how I would term it. We've seen, obviously, the loan prime rate for five years get cut last week. That should feed through into thinking about better mortgage pricing and hopefully some stability in the property market. But again, I think at the moment, the, the market's coming off a, a very low level. You've seen probably what's more tactical than thinking about a sustained uh, improvement in the economy and the market and so we're just a, a little bit cautious in terms of seeing how this progresses. We really want to see more of a turn in the economy to have uh, a little bit more faith that the outlook for the market is going to be supported rather than maybe perhaps seeing people uh, potentially just selling these rallies at the moment. So I think it's a little bit early for us to become an overweight towards China at this moment. We want to see more on the economic outlook really starting to improve uh, in our mind before becoming uh, more positive on the equity market. You mentioned Korea, and, and that is a bit of a cyclical story. Are, are you still a little bit cautious there? I mean, yeah, the market's done really well last year. Valuations have moved up. Uh, I think it does feed through into a lot of the secular theme you're seeing around the demand for semiconductors as well as that inventory cycle starting to come back through. I mean, across equities around the world, um, there's pockets of, of valuation that have moved up. I think that's more of a case of thinking about what drives the markets higher from this point. It's not going to be a lot of valuation re-rating in most cases. It is about that earnings outlook, and I think that you are seeing some justification to the earnings outlook in, in those markets. And what, what, on that earnings front, what did you make so far, really, of, of the, the US that's wrapping up, uh, Australia as well, fairly progressed? Yeah, there's a couple of uh, consistent themes across those markets. The first is that you know companies have done a pretty good job in terms of uh, protecting those margins and controlling costs. Uh, again, that's been something that's been quite positive in terms of thinking about um, the ability of margins to really add to those um, earnings growth outlook last year and the continuation of that. So for the US case, we, we're not thinking about a big drop in the margins. We're thinking about something that could be um, held, if not move up a little bit, and that would deliver that earnings growth. We don't think our uh, estimates of earnings growth for the US market match what we're seeing in terms of a consensus. They're a little bit below that, but we have seen some of those consensus earnings growth numbers come down. And we are revising our own upwards a little bit based on the strength of those earnings. So I think that that positive sort of high to single digit earnings growth in the US does justify keeping that overweight towards the market there. And then more broadly, when we look into the Australian, we are seeing you know something that's uh, a similar story around the costs of being controlled, about the resilience and the consumer playing through. But again, the earnings outlook here has been relatively uh, depressed compared to what we've seen uh, around the world. We do see potential for that uplift, thinking about very low single digits in terms of that earnings growth, whereas consensus is closer to zero. So a little bit of surprise coming through. For the Australian market, though, we'd remain relatively defensive, looking towards healthcare, um, looking towards some of the industrials a little bit, but really thinking about um, some of the risks that come with um, the, the pricing in terms of financials, uh, the miners, um, and also thinking about the energy stocks as well. Kerry, are you gaming out a scenario where there is a change in political leadership in the US next year? And, and I suppose that leads me to a broader question about how you're looking at the risks and opportunities from geopolitical developments. 
I mean, they're, they're ever present. Uh, I think over the last couple of years, obviously, investors have had to deal with a lot on that front. Um, when it comes to the US election, the outlook, I mean, it does seem increasingly likely that you're going to have uh, a Republican nominee that is Donald Trump uh, facing off against Joe Biden. Um, there is still a long way to go in terms of thinking about um, the policy implications and what that may mean for markets between now um, and the election or the inauguration of a, of a president in January next year. There's some takeaways we can think about in terms of the tax changes that may come through. Um, um, and how that may affect um, sort of corporate taxes and how gov companies have been benefiting from that, some of the extensions that come through there, should there be a change in leadership. But all of it does come down to whether it is a, a split Congress uh, who's really in the White House and how that may play through in terms of what's done um, at a bipartisan level or partisan level and what's done through executive orders. So I think that there's a case building to think about the ramifications of a change in leadership in the US, but there's still a lot of uncertainty around how that structure of Congress may um, actually look look like to, to actually really dictate what the policy response would be. And so I think it's a case of watching but not really adjusting portfolios just yet to think about those implications. Kerry, always great to chat with you, Kerry Craig, Global Market Strategist at JP Morgan Asset Management. We're still ahead. We'll be hearing from the co-founder of the startup Team Shares, the firm that buys out company founders to keep businesses going as they set their sights on Japan. But before that, Berkshire Hathaway, the cash hold there, jumping to a record $167 billion. The billionaire investor saying that they're struggling to find deals at attractive valuations. We get the details next. This is Bloomberg. Taking a look at the week ahead, we'll be uh, watching the latest GDP and inflation readings out of the US. Of course, Bloomberg Economics expecting headline and core PCE numbers to come in hot for the fourth quarter. Japan also releasing CPI data. Core inflation seemed to undershoot the BOJ's 2% target for the first time since March 2022 against the backdrop of the economy slipping into recession. And we'll also be getting fresh PMI readings out of China on Friday, likely to show activity pulling back due to disruptions from the Lunar New Year holiday. And the Reserve Bank of New Zealand expected to keep rates on hold as it waits for more evidence that inflation is under control. On the earnings front, we're watching Baidu and NetEase as China tightens its grip across tech companies. Meanwhile, lenders OCBC and Maybank could post stronger net income following on the footsteps of some of these other Southeast Asian banks that we've had so far. That is your week ahead. Well, Berkshire Hathaway's cash bar hit a new record of $167.6 billion in the fourth quarter. The conglomerate struggling to find meaningful deals. Bloomberg's finance editor Adam Haig is with us. So what's your takeaway, uh, other than valuations are high, um, from these numbers that we've gotten? Well, obviously, really intriguing that that, that cash pile is so big now. Mm. But it's more about kind of the some of the exploring um, deals that they have been looking at and and kind of have shied away from. So clearly, there's still kind of a lot going on. You know, we've had subdued deal activity around the world, but there have been you know deals go through, and and, and indeed Berkshire has still been spending uh, money in certain areas. But of course, it does speak to not just elevated valuations in in the equity market, but in in uh, some of the other markets. You know, there are still uh, number of areas in private markets that are, that are particularly testing. Um, so I think it, it, it tells us a few things really, but but one is that um, it was a very notable comment about um, opportunities outside of the US being essentially zero, um, really not finding much opportunity uh, beyond the borders of the US. Um, Japan, of course, has been one of the big focuses for, 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 for Berkshire, and, and that's been an interesting market. Uh, for the way that they've been buying businesses there, but also for the broader impact that international capital flowing into Japan now has become really a huge story. And of course, uh, the Nikkei taking out the, the historical levels last week shows you just how much of a change in sentiment there have been to, 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 to Japanese businesses in recent times. And, and Berkshire is obviously one huge component of that. They see and continue to see some really interesting ideas there. So I think Japan still stands out as a key market for them there. Yeah. And in Japan, as well as places like Australia, it's interesting. We have seen.
seen deal activity picking up a little bit. What does it tell you about, I guess, broader risk appetite right now? We have, haven't we, Heidi? We've seen some deals kind of coming through in the early part of this year. I mean, we're only kind of, you know, just almost getting into March, so just a couple of months. It is still early, but but there have been some pretty notable transactions, and especially if you, if you look here, you know, some of the uh, Japanese M&A coming into Australia, uh, Renesos, that, that deal. Um, and indeed, with some of these businesses that, that Berkshire's bought in, in Japan, these trading houses, that's an $8 billion investment now. And, and, and you know, they're there for a far longer term uh, turnaround um, story there. And of course, a lot of the reasons why they're there is because of some of these long term changes in shareholder attitude that, that, you know, changes that don't take a few months, that take many years to come through. We're starting to see the early signs of that in Korea, uh, whether that becomes uh, another market for them in the future on those kind of terms, we'll have to wait and see. But yeah, clearly some deals are coming back now and you're starting to see some opportunity there for them. Bloomberg's Adam Haig here and uh, latest on Berkshire Health where you can get a roundup of some of those stories including that one in your uh, to get your morning going in today's edition of Daybreak. Terminal subscribers can find that at JP Go. It's also available on the mobile in the Bloomberg Anywhere app. You can customise those settings as well so you just get the news on the industries and assets that matter to you. This is Bloomberg. Let's take a look at some of the latest headlines we're tracking across politics. And President Vladimir Zelensky says Ukraine has lost 31,000 soldiers as the war against Russia's invasion enters its third year. He also reiterated calls for U.S. funding, saying that a decision from U.S. Congress is needed in a month. Zelensky adding that 2024 will determine how the war will end. President Biden and fellow G7 leaders have assured Zelensky of their support in a video conference call. They say that they're stepping up security assistance and working with Kyiv to meet its financing needs. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer warning President Biden that risks uh, warns that President Biden risks losing support among the U.S. state's Arab and Muslim population over his support for Israel. Democrats are worried that Biden's pro-Israel stance will alienate voters in Michigan, which is home to a large Arab American population. A January poll showed Biden trailing Republican frontrunner Donald Trump in a state in a hypothetical 2024 rematch. Nikki Haley's hopes for the 2024 Republican presidential nomination took another blow as Donald Trump swept the primary in her home state of South Carolina. Haley has vowed to stay in the race through to Super Tuesday on March 5th. Despite his mounting legal issues, Trump has triumphed in all contests held to date. Haley is his last remaining serious challenger. A Republican straw poll has found that either Christy Noam or Vivek Ramshwamy are seen as favourites for Trump's potential running mate. Noam, the South Dakota governor, and Ramshwamy, who ran unsuccessfully for the Republican nomination, were both top picks from attendees at the Conservative Political Action Conference. The poll also found that Trump had a 94% support level versus just 5% for Nikki Haley. Australia and the United Arab Emirates are expecting to conclude a free trade agreement by the end of the year. That's according to the Australian Trade Minister Don Farrell. His remarks come as he heads to Abu Dhabi for this week's meeting of the World Trade Organization. Well, Alan joins us now with more. So what else are we hearing from the Trade Minister about this deal and others in the works? Uh, well, both sides are motivated here, Australia and the UAE, and it looks pretty straightforward. Um, from Australia's perspective, uh, Don Farrell would like uh, the process to be smooth for the UAE's sovereign wealth fund to invest in Australia, uh, particularly around the renewables area. Uh, for the UAE, it says um, you know, the two sides are in a good position to start talking about a deal. Uh, this is Australia's largest trading partner in the Middle East, and it could be a launch pad for the broader Middle East as well. Two-way trade isn't huge. It's $6.1 billion uh, approximately. Uh, but if we take a look at what it involves, uh, aluminium, uh, aluminium meats, uh, education as well, Crucially, the two countries aren't competitors in this area, so it makes it a whole lot easier to get a deal done than, say, with the EU, with India. Both those deals are stalled, and we're probably not going to see any development this week. Uh, Australia is going to wait until elections and both those jurisdictions are over. And, Paul, uh, WTO reform is going to be one of the key items on the agenda. Do we expect to see any sort of progress there? 
Yeah, at the risk of sounding cynical, it's always on the agenda and it pretty much always ends with a tepid commitment to just keep it on the agenda. It doesn't really seem to go anywhere. Uh, one of the things that all parties really want to do is try and revive the appeals court, uh, the appellate body as it's known. Now this hasn't really operated since uh, 2019 under the Trump presidency. The US uh, stopped or started blocking appointments to that appellate body and there's kind of a hesitancy to move the ball down the field as it were uh, with the possibility of another Trump presidency on the horizon. So that's likely to not see a great deal of movement until after November. Uh, Don Farrell said that look WTO reform is always difficult but it really shouldn't depend on who is or isn't in the White House uh, but also on the sidelines of this uh, you know Australia has used this appeals body previously to get through some of its trade difficulties with China uh, which have been pretty well publicized. Now there's been a lot of movement on that front. Uh, Don Farrell is going to meet his Chinese counterpart on the sidelines of this meeting at Abu Dhabi this week. Um, most of those trade strikes have been removed. There's still some in place against wine, but we're expecting some good news on that front. And Australian winemakers are quietly gearing up for a return to China. It's been a challenging few years for Australian winemakers. When China slapped tariffs of up to 200 per cent on Aussie wines in 2020, it left the industry scrambling to find new markets. We lost everything overnight. We had built a business in China. When Australia called for an international investigation into the origins of COVID-19, China responded with a range of trade strikes against Australian products. The relationship has since thawed, barriers against barley, coal and other exports are now gone and wine is expected to be next. Australia suspended its appeal at the World Trade Organisation over the wine tariffs when China announced a five-month review. That review ends on March 31st. Australia's Trade Minister will meet his Chinese counterpart on the sidelines of the WTO meeting in Abu Dhabi. We want the tariffs on Australian wine removed and if we don't get that, then we'll resume the WTO uh, application ASAP. Our agreement to suspend the WTO process uh, was based on the successful removal of all of the tariffs. Shares in Australia's largest listed winemaker Treasury Wine Estates have slowly recovered since China imposed the tariffs in November 2020. In this month's earnings announcement, Treasury also signalled it's expecting something to celebrate soon. The review of tariffs on Australian wine remains ongoing, with a determination anticipated in late March. We are prepared and we're well placed to re-establish ourselves and our Australian portfolio in China should the review result in the removal of these tariffs. But there's a question about what Australia's exporters have learned from the whole experience when it comes to reliance on China. Take barley, for example. China went from buying almost all of Australia's barley to buying none at all during the diplomatic deep freeze, forcing exporters to diversify and find new markets. Since tariffs were lifted, Australia's barley producers have gone straight back to their most lucrative buyer, with China accounting for 90% of exports in December. And of course, when wine begins to flow, memories can become hazy. Paul Allen, Bloomberg. Take a look at uh, how we're tracking when it comes to the FX side of things. And of course, it is a big week of eco, potentially uh, quite a lot of uh, direction to be set when it comes to what we see for the US dollar in particular, given that we do have the Fed's preferred gauge of inflation coming through. And that would uh, possibly kind of add to the narrative that we've seen, not just from Fed speakers talking about caution when it comes to maintaining the fight against inflation, but of course what we've seen uh, with some of those inflation numbers out of the US coming in hotter than expected. The dollar rally is kind of looking pretty at pretty tepid I should say at this point of course it notched the first weekly decline of the year last week again it was these comments from Fed speakers on the timing to start rate reductions that weighed pretty pretty heavily we did see some of the outperformers in this part of the world including the Kiwi dollar uh, and the Aussie dollar this morning also maintaining uh, a little bit of resilience there dollar China looking pretty steady and dollar yen is the one to watch 150.51 is where we're at some of that volatility though is uh, seen to start to falling as we have again this d kind of dueling force curbing the trading range that we see. Dollar yen's tight trading range has been weighing on options volatility here as that sort of expected measure of volatility and movement falling to the lowest since March 2022. This is Bloomberg.
Mike, you're watching Daybreak Australia. The latest corporate stories for you today. And KKR is said to be nearing a deal worth about $4 billion to buy a software business from Broadcom. Sources say the deal could be closed by the start of the week. Broadcom is selling its end-user computer unit, which is inherited through its acquisition of VMware. The business provides software enabling users to access desktops and applications remotely. BYD unveiled its most expensive EV supercar on Sunday. The fully electric Yangwang U9 costs over $233,000 and will be initially for the Chinese market. BYD says the supercar can hit 100 kilometers per hour in about two seconds and reach a top speed of 309 kilometers per hour. The vehicle aims to rival the gas guzzling options offered by Ferrari and Lamborghini. Disney and Reliance Industries are said to have signed a binding pact to merge their media operations in India. Sources say the media unit of Reliance and its affiliates are expected to own at least 61% in the merged entity, with Disney holding the rest. They say details of the deal are likely to be announced this week. Well, Standard Chartered CEO Bill Winter says the bank took no impairments from the Chinese real estate market for the last quarter. He told Bloomberg he sees a long recovery ahead for the sector. I think we've seen now several quarters of stability, but that's with, it, with a consistent level of stimulus that has just kept it from falling. So, look, we've got 88% coverage on our at-risk Chinese commercial real estate portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're, we've written it off. Uh, the, I, I hope we get some recoveries one day, but I think it's going to be a long recovery, just as, as a practical matter. We were way ahead of the market in, in taking those provisions, uh, as we were way ahead of the market in, in, in taking other provisions related to, to other businesses that have been impaired. We also set the target two years ago of tripling, sorry, of doubling our profits in China over three years. Mm -hmm. We've almost done it in two, mm -hmm. doubling the profits. Now, the juxtaposition of China's having a tough time with we doubled our profits, that's a pretty good outcome. And it's a good outcome because we're generating good, strong top-line growth because yeah. we connect China to the world and the world to China. That's what we do, and those connections are stronger than ever. Are there major impairments coming through from the China exposure for Standard Chartered? No. Uh, we took virtually no exposure, no impairments on our China real estate in the fourth quarter. We did in earlier quarters. Uh, we've also taken impairments in earlier quarters on our stake in Bohai Bank, mm -hmm. which we took a, a relatively small impairment in the fourth quarter. Uh, you know, this is a kind of a mechanical calculation value in use were properly provided. Commercial real estate, of course, in focus as well in the West, in Europe, in the US. Do you see opportunities there, given the valuation drops? Yeah, there could be. I mean, we're not going to be heroes uh, in, in the commercial real estate market, but we're relatively underweight commercial real estate. We're relatively underweight leveraged finance, two areas that have been hit quite hard on the back of higher interest rates. Uh, will there be opportunities for us to, to improve the quality of our franchise using our balance sheet in a prudent way? Getting some of that asset growth that actually has been a bit elusive for us, getting that back in through some of the areas where we've, our prudence has kept us out of harm's way. That's why we have such low loan impairments. Yeah, there's, there's great opportunities. It's starting to look attractive to you now. Yeah, I, Commercial I, 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 look, I'm not calling the bottom of any of okay. that. I, I've also been in the higher for longer rate category, yeah. right? Uh, and I'm, I'm no pundit when it comes to interest rates, but it has felt to me that the U.S. job market is particularly strong. Wage growth is strong. That means higher for longer. And yeah, obviously, that's what the market is saying now. That was Standard Chartered CEO Bill Winters there speaking to Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie in London. Take a look at how we're trading. We're just about half an hour into the start of the cash session here in Sydney. Uh, a little bit of upside, about four tenths of one percent here. Uh, we did see sort of a pretty start, a flat start to trading, so we're starting to incrementally see a little bit more gains. But broadly across the region, we are expecting perhaps a bit of a directional recession or perhaps struggling com for conviction here in Asia. We had U.S. shares really closing a little change on Friday, but still pretty close to those, re those record highs. And perhaps you can't uh, blame a little bit of profit taking or a breather being taken after just uh, the the big rally that we had following those Nvidia numbers we're seeing Treasury yields falling as well after we heard from John Williams on Friday talking about uh, the probability that Fed will probably cut rates at some point this year a bit of a mixed picture there for the dollar as well Singapore Nikkei futures looking like a tenth of one percent we could see the Nikkei 225 looking to add uh, a bit more gains when it comes to uh, demand from foreign investors in particular and of course on Thursday we did see just before that public holiday in the long weekend 
weekend in Japan uh, that the Nikkei 225 did finally manage to clinch that December uh, 1989 record high. Big day for earnings for Japan as well. We've got the likes of uh, quite a few numbers coming through, but in particular some news flow when it comes to uh, Nippon Steel, Toyota and Kyoksa in particular. TSMC is one to watch today with the Japanese government announcing additional subsidies for the company. U.S. Uh, futures bell looking pretty flat at this point. Yeah, but Heidi, I mean, you mentioned those gains we've seen in, in Japan. Where else we're seeing a lot of foreign inflows is South Korea. And uh, it's going to be unveiling more details of its corporate reform plan called Value Up in the next hour. It's a program that aims to encourage listed companies to come up with measures to boost their corporate value. The reform bets have encouraged global investors to pile into South Korean stocks. And you can see that, that our performance we have at the Kospi over the broader Asian benchmark. Well, let's get more on it now with our Asia stocks reporter, Yoo Kyung Lee, here in Seoul. And Yoo Kyung, just uh, kick off by telling us a little bit more about the, the Value Up program. Yes, good morning. So this corporate value up program to be announced in about an hour with more details is part of the broader uh, initiative led by the President Yoon song yeol in South Korea to end this Korea stock discount, which refers to this persistent under, undervaluation of South Korean stocks compared with its global peers in Taiwan or Japan because of this poor uh, corporate governance um, and also because of this meager shareholder returns. Now, the current uh, administration in South Korea wants to change that and it has been introducing several steps to do that and this corporate value up program is one of the most important feature in this uh, initiative to end the Korea stock discount. Now since uh, South Korean government hinted that it's going to unveil these measures uh, of corporate value up program which sounds very similar to what Japan has done with um, naming and shaming the companies that are not doing enough to return to investors. Um, uh, global investor has been piling into South Korean stock markets. So uh, the South Korea's uh, benchmark Kospi has been one of the laggard in January. But since after the, this value up program has been hinted by the South Korean government, the Kospi has become one of the best performing uh, index in the world um, because foreign investor has been piling into adding more than 10 trillion won or more than 7 billion US dollar into benchmark Kospi since late, late January. So what would be the key criteria for the value up program in, 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 in being seen as successful, right, to end the career discount? Yes, sure. So this value of program success probably hinges on how much participation you can see from the South Korean companies. Uh, uh, South Korea's government already has said it's going to expect the voluntary measures, voluntary participation from the South Korean companies, rather than making the making the uh, making making the shareholder improvement measures a requirement or mandatory to these South Korean companies. Now um, there are a lot of uh, South Korean conglomerates that are controlled by the founding family stills and in order to in order to make this founding families um, act more uh, do more for the broader shareholders rather than just the smaller founding fa uh, controlling families uh, South Korea's government must be giving a lot of incentives if, if, he, if it's expecting the South Korea's company to participate in this measure voluntarily so uh, the key to success would be seeing the broader uh, and active participation from the South Korean companies, uh, which some say uh, may not be enough if the measure is not the compulsory one. Uh, but we are going to get more details about what kind of measures it's going to contain within the value up program in about an hour. And we'll see about the market reactions to these details. Oh, Asia stocks reporter Yoo Kyung Lee there in Seoul. Well, widespread walkout by South Korean trainee doctors is headed into its second week, but there are no signs that the government will back down from its plan to boost the number of physicians in the country. For more, let's bring in East Asia government editor John Herskovich. And John, we spoke about this with you last week. Does it look like this is going to be uh, quite a prolonged and extensive labour action now? Well, we're seeing both sides really digging in. I think uh, this week we're going to see a bit of an intensification. The um, graduate train graduates who are going into internships 
are saying that they're not going to take their post, which is the next step. Doctors are looking to do a uh, protest uh, maybe over the weekend, and the government is um, threatening even more and more to do investigations, possibly arrests, and they have a really powerful tool in that they can suspend the licenses of doctors who are taking part in a labor action that is seemed illegal as because it's hurting the medical system. So this week we're going to see both sides really trying to dig in a bit more, and it has the potential to grow on for quite a bit, but this will be, I think, a crucial week in deciding if it's going to be a shorter action or a prolonged action. And really, as you said, it could be something that is is quite a prolonged strike, but the, but the public sentiment really does seem to favour the government on this issue. Exactly. And South Korea is one of the fastest ageing countries in the world. The government's plan is to add uh, 2,000 seats in medical schools to bring more doctors in to alleviate a shortage. About 75% of the public supports the plan. The uh, government has seen its approval rating go up because of this. And while doctors are complaining that uh, this, will, this plan doesn't address uh, some of their working conditions, it doesn't... Uh, it doesn't correct fundamental problems. The public is seeing waiting times that have grown longer because of this, surgeries that have been canceled, the, med the emergency medical care system is on a high state of crisis, and the public is seeing health care that's not being delivered, which is not something that is helping the doctors, especially when three quarters of the public sides with the government in the plan to increase medical enrollment. John, you talk about one of the, the, the bugbears being the doctors say uh, just adding more doctors is not going to fix the structural problems with the healthcare system, uh, the, the labour conditions and so on and so forth. Has the government got any plan to actually address these issues? Well, the government's uh, thinking is that if there are more doctors, there are more, there, there are more people who can go into uh, specialty fields which haven't been able to attract a lot of people, that uh, if there are more doctors, they can go to rural areas which are sometimes underserved. Um, the doctors are arguing that we'll just see an intensification of the uh, urban concentration of doctors, that uh, pay needs to be increased in some of these specialties which aren't seen as higher paying, that the government's plan won't address these problems. So we're seeing different sides of this, but the idea is now we have, South Korea has about 3,000 people a year admitted to medical school and with this plan there would be 5,000. So over time there will be more and more doctors and they're hoping that the supply will help meet the demand and fill the slots which aren't being filled now. That was our East Asia government editor John Herskowitz there and up next our interview with the co-founder of US startup TeamShares about how they're bringing their employee ownership succession model to Japan. This is Bloomberg. Time for Japan ahead, and we're watching January PPI data due out in the next few minutes. Economists surveyed by Bloomberg forecasting that business survey price growth holding steady at a three decade high. We'll also be watching ship related shares. The government announcing an additional $4.86 billion in subsidies for TSMC to expand its plant in the country. Uh, Toyota and some of the other auto stocks are also on the radar. Japan's transport minister asking car makers to conduct internal probes for any misconduct amid scandals that have been Toyota's units and Japanese markets will come back online after the long weekend at the top of the next hour and uh, a little bit of catch up but also potentially a little bit of catch down given we had very muted moves in the US session on Friday but of course still so much of that huge AI tech related rally that we saw after the Nvidia numbers came out but Japanese equity markets uh, coming back with investors really looking for the Nikkei 225 to breach the 40,000 level for the first time so we've notched that December 19. 89 high. 40,000 is a number that we're watching now. In the meantime, we're seeing dollar yen re remaining firmly above 150. That flags, of course, a risk of more verbal intervention, at least from Ministry of Finance officials to try and support the yen. That kind of uh, pull of, uh, you know, tug of war within the uh, drivers of where we see going for the yen really playing out at the moment. Uh, this is a picture as we, Bell, get into the start of trading in just about 15 minutes or so in Japan. 
Yeah, Heidi, big rally in, in the large caps, but where we've actually seen some challenges in Japan are for smaller firms because they've struggled for years to hand their businesses off to a buyer or a successor. Our next guest is the co-founder of US startup TeamShares, which buys out company founders and owners to keep their businesses going. Backed by Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi UFJ, the firm is bringing its model to Japan in its first overseas foray. Joining us from Tokyo is Kevin Rikyoshiba, the co-founder and head of Japan at TeamShares. And Kevin, yeah, I gave a few details there. Perhaps it was a little bit difficult to hear me with my voice today. So why don't you just kick us off by telling us a little bit more about what Team Shares does and also why you're choosing to enter the Japan market. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, so Team Shares is an entirely new employee ownership succession model for small business. So we work with retiring business owners of traditional successful small businesses and we help them retire by purchasing the business. We install employee ownership and gradually transition the business to majority employee ownership within 20 years, so 80% employee ownership. And uh, we do this in, because we're trying to end the succession problem for good. And so these businesses end up being permanently co-owned by team shares and the employee owners, which means that the business never has to face a succession challenge again. The business never needs to sell again in the future. And as of uh, you know, today, team shares over the past four years has acquired 90 small businesses in the U.S., across 31 of the 50 United States, 42 different industries, and we've created over 2,500 new employee shareholders at all of the, our businesses, and many of whom are becoming shareholders in their business for the very first time. And we know that this works. Uh, employee ownership, uh, you know, employee-owned companies in the U.S. have been shown to grow 2 to 3% faster than their peers, be more resilient during downturns, and are just overall um, you know, sort of happier places to work. And, uh, and Team Shares is you know, really excited to be bringing this employer ownership succession model to Japan, uh, specifically because you know, Japan arguably is, is uh, you know, in the middle of an even more severe succession problem than in the US. So in the US, 70% uh, you know, of small business owners that look to sell end up failing to sell, which is a huge loss for the community because these businesses often end up shutting down. In Japan, uh, by 2025, 2.45 million small business owners will end up uh, end up having to, you know, be thir seven, sorry, 70 years or older, which is the average age of retirement. Uh, which means that about so half of those business owners who haven't identified. Yes, sorry. You mentioned those those various industries for the U.S. Those 90 plus acquisitions. Are there any key sectors or business models that you're looking for in Japan? Would they be the same as what you've done in the U.S. so far? Yeah. So we are we are definitely looking across you know a broad base of U.S. small businesses. Our mission is to create employer ownership in as many small businesses as possible. So that means we're not focused on very narrow sectors like potentially other firms. Uh, so in the U.S. we have six core sectors business services, consumer services, uh, distribution, light manufacturing, restaurants, and retail. And so we'll be looking across a wide breadth of, you, of Japan's small businesses to make sure that we can help in bring the impact to as many uh, new small businesses as possible. And you know, for Japanese small business owners, uh, you know, they're, they're seeing a very similar um, trend like we're seeing in the US, which is these business owners, their children have gone off to have other careers. They don't necessarily want to take over the family business in the same way. And uh, increasingly, you know, these business owners are looking to try to find a successor. Half of those 2.45 million small business owners in Japan have yet to identify a successor yet. And if they can't find that successor, it could be a huge impact on you know, the Japanese economy. It could result in potentially 6.5 million jobs that are lost, over 22 trillion yen of GDP that could be potentially lost. And so uh, we believe that our model, our employee ownership succession model in Japan is one that is uh, a really great fit in between traditional employee succession and M&A. And traditional employee succession typically 
it's one to two managers buying out the business, and they have often have tr trouble coming up with the capital. And so TeamShares, the reason why we started was really to help uh, the employees inherit a majority of the business. And you know, my co-founders Alex and Michael, mm. they they worked in uh, small business for you know for many many years. They they owned uh, eight of them before we started TeamShares together, and deeply understand the challenges that small business owners face when they're looking for a successor. And so when we started TeamShares, we really wanted to create a model that allows these businesses to be more durable and it allows us also right. to make a small dent in wealth inequality as well by expanding access to small business uh, employees to own shares in the businesses, which many of them haven't had the opportunity to before. Kevin, I understand this is such a big play on the inevitable demographics of Japan. Does that mean you're looking at other markets as well beyond the US and Japan now? Yeah, so our mission has always been able, uh, always been to create employee-owned businesses, uh, you know, and help the, sort of uh, a generation of small business owners transition those businesses um, into the next generation, and their employees uh, become shareholders in the business. And while we started in the U.S., we truly believe that this is a global problem. And when we looked at Japan third largest economy, arguably even more severe succession crisis. In, in Japan, we really were excited to um, by the, the response of when we started to actually announce what we were doing in the U.S., over half of the discourse online was actually in Japan. And a lot of people reached out to us saying, you should bring your model to Japan. We'd already been researching um, entering the market. And so that was really confirmation to us that we could really make an impact here. So to answer your question, we're focused on U.S. and Japan right now. And we're looking for other uh, you know, financial parties and other people who really share our mission and passion for helping this generation of small businesses transition, change hands, and the employees ultimately um, you know, receiving shares in the businesses that they work in. Kevin, really great to have you with us. Kevin Rikirishiba, co-founder at Team Shares. And you can, of course, catch Japan Ahead every week. That's every Monday at 8.40 a.m. if you're watching in Tokyo, 7.40 in the evening on Sunday if you're watching in New York. Bloomberg subscribers can watch us live on the Terminal 2. That's at the TV Go function. This is Bloomberg. These are the stocks we're watching when trade opens in Korea and Japan shortly. Keep an eye out uh, on chip shares. Japan announcing an extra $4.8 billion in subsidies for TSMC uh, for plant expansion in the country. We're also watching trading in Toyota and some of those auto peers. Japan's transport ministry ordering an industry investigation amid safety scandals at two of Toyota's units. Plus, Samsung, LG Inotech are also uh, on watch. The news that Jeff Bezos and NVIDIA are investing in the startup Figure AI they are developing human-like robots. Samsung has invested $5 million, while LG Inatech has invested $8.5 million into that business. Coming up in the next hour of Daybreak, Morgan Stanley says Asia and EM equity markets have had a highly divergent start to 2024. We'll be taking a look at their market strategy next. We'll also be speaking with the Heinrich Foundation about what to expect from the World Trade Organization's ministerial conference taking place in Abu Dhabi. The market opens in Seoul and Tokyo are next. This is Bloomberg.